we continue to ask you to wrestle with doubt. Not because we want to fill you with doubts, but because we want you to gain better answers or at least ask better questions. Do you know anybody that goes to the store, let's say Publix, and it's a new Publix, and if you go to any Publix, you know that they are all different. And are you one of those people that if you're going to go get something, you ask an employee, where is that thing? Or you take it upon yourself, you're going to walk up and down until you find it, which kind of person you are. I am the person that will ask a person, hey, where is this? And I will go exactly where it is. I was recently with my father, and he was hungry, and he wanted to go to every single aisle in Publix to see what he was hungry for. It doesn't work like that, Papi, I said. Well, we're here, right? Again, for many people, how you find answers is different. And today, as we've been doing it for now a couple of weeks, is for you to try to gain better answers. Because doubts, doubts can lead you to more awareness and to mature your faith. That's the goal that we have. Uh, if you want to continue reading more, because I am not really going, do, giving you a synopsis of the chapter every week. What I'm giving you is what I take from the book, but also, and more importantly, what I take from the gospel, which I read, from the scriptures that I read. If you're interested in purchasing one of the books, you can find them in the parlor. They are $15. You can continue reading them and participating in the small groups that we have. But in chapter 3, is a question of where are they going? They being whomever you think doesn't fit with what Christianity is. Where are they going? This is a major doubt for a lot of people. And I could aim to persuade you about where they are going but the idea is that you explore this question yourself. Where are they going? My goal is to inspire you for you to prayerfully consider what God says to you on this day and what role you may play in helping others to explore the divinity and the truth of the gospel. If you read chapter 3, chapter 3 will give you some facts. It says that 68% of the world does not consider Jesus as Lord. You can find this in page 61, 61, 62 of the Kindle edition. But 68% of the people claim another faith or no faith at all. Are they going to be tormented in hell forever because they did not understand or could not believe in the Christian gospel? I mean, this applies to you, even to you. Do you have people in your life? Do you have people in your family, in your neighborhood that cannot understand and won't accept Jesus as Lord? Do you have a child, a brother, a sibling, maybe even your spouse who rejects the gospel? Are they simply doomed to hell? Is that something that is easy to be absorbed, or do you have any questions in regards to this? I hope that you do have questions, because it's, it's quite simple for us to just say, well, faith is about a personal thing, where today I'm telling you there are so many different ways to engage with the gospel, engage in the church. You know, we have a congregational meeting today, and we have worship at 10. It seems that we've been having one worship for a long time because of the way that the calendar worked. And when I saw that the weather was going to look like I was in upstate New York again, it was quite easy to see that we were needed to create a Zoom, a, a Zoom meeting for those who could join us on Zoom. Right now, there are 18 devices connected online participating online now. 
And I say devices because I don't know how many people are behind each of the devices, at least 18 people. And there are people connected on the website, and there are people connected on YouTube. If you look at the annual report that we have, that we gave you, the one with all the pictures, by the way, all those pictures were taken in 2023. And if you go to, if you go to page two, you will see how change the church has. The active membership, that means that the people who are active in the church last year was 235. However, we are, or two years ago in 2022, and if you look at 23, you will see that there's now 191. We have had our share of people of funerals. You will see members of the church on page three. You will see the active membership, male and female. You will see the gains. You will see also that the average attendance of the church and what is that? So we're claiming 191 active members and our attendance is 185 in average. And compared to that, and I know that comparing and working numbers is difficult, but I'm only pointing to this to you to say that things have changed and there is no going back. It's, uh, you might say, different outlook. However, if you pay attention to, let me find it. If you go to page 20, you will see the statement of activities. And down the line of 2023, you will see the total revenues on order support without donor restriction was $680,000. You see how sometimes numbers give you a different perspective? How is it possible? Because if you pay attention to four years ago, five years ago, how is it possible that the church is in average receiving just the same amount of financial support as before? by having and also having less people. How is it possible? These are the questions that I want you to, to ask because how people are engaging in faith is different. The faith of the fathers no longer is there. Adam Hamilton, who writes this book, writes this. The question about other religions is one of the biggest struggles with the whole Christianity thing. I cannot accept that a good, kind, loving, gracious, just God will send a kind, caring, loving, faithful Hindu to hell simply because they didn't accept Jesus. Have you considered that? You know, I never expected that me having a team, Team Jesus... And if you're wondering why, why flamingos, the reality is that it was a clear message for me that I love to share with others. It says, when, I, when you're a flamingo and you're cool, it's because if your life is Christ and your death is gain, you are as a cool as a flamingo at the beach sipping in a piña colada. And obviously, it's a piece of conversation so every time that I wear it now on the field, it says, what is that about? And it's an opportunity for me to say, well, it's not that Jesus is in my team, it's that I am his team. And you are welcome too. And then, obviously, the questions. When Trevor said, Mario, I'm a Jew. Do you want to be part of my team? I promise you that you're not going to hear hate. Or violence. In fact, I'm going to ask you what you think. What I do want to do is to love you. That's the team that I'm asking you to be. Also, you're a great outfield. So, that's also that. If you continue reading, and again, I'm not going to give you a, a rundown of the chapter, but if you continue reading, Amal Hamilton tells you that in the Old Testament, the idea that God will condemn all non-Jews and non-Israelites to eternal torment for not having accepted the faith of Israelite people is false. There is no point in the Old Testament that tells you 
that other people have to become Israelites. And there is not even a promise of hell for others. In the whole Old Testament, there is not a conversation of heaven and there is not a conversation of hell. Can you believe that? Have you heard that before? Does that give you doubts or questions? Obviously, you can find it in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, there is no conversation about that. So why, are, as Christians, are we so stuck in the idea of hell versus heaven? You know, growing up in Colombia, I have a friend who became a doctor, and he's very successful as a doctor. However, he rose to fame because he decided to do breast implant to a 12-year-old. She wanted to. Her father wanted to. She wanted to be a YouTuber or whatever. And he decided that, yeah, sure, he was going to do that for her. He's a doctor. However, he's the kind of doctor, he said it, I am here for the money. If you're willing to pay me, I'm willing to do whatever you ask. I also know lawyers who will do anything for money. I also do... And know of other people who will do anything for money. And I'm sure that deep down inside of you, you are saying, oh man, that's wrong. Well, how do you think God feels or Jesus feels when Christians are only Christians to avoid hell? Have you ever thought about that? If the whole point of Christianity is to avoid hell, what's the difference? between you just being a lawyer or a doctor who just wants money. If you're just here to avoid hell rather than the better, more purposeful option, which is to love God, isn't that the challenge of today? What does Jesus say, and you continue reading this in Adam Hamilton's book, who is going to hell? Adam Hamilton says, Jesus says, all those who are in anger call others you fool will be in danger of hell, Matthew 5, 22. He knows that those who lust over a woman in their hearts will be in danger of hell, Matthew 5, 27, 30. He says that those who succumb to temptation, Matthew 18, and religious hypocrites, Matthew 22, those are the ones in danger of hell. How come Jesus is not saying anything about Christianity? How come Jesus doesn't say anything about those who claim my name will be saved? I hope that you are having enough ideas and thoughts and imaginations that you are considering. What is it that you believe about heaven? What is it that you believe about hell? How are you going to approach this subject? If you continue reading the book, you will see three big terms that they discuss. And I will encourage you to read it so that you explore it. It's called Christian exclusivism, which means that only Christians and only those who profess Jesus as Lord and Savior will be saved. Then there is universalism, which talks not Unitarian universalism, but Christian universalism. And then you can read about inclusivism. Those are big terms. And at some point, I hope and I pray that you continue to explore this to see where you land. Because it's good to be asking questions to have better answers. However, I'm done talking about the chapter and what Adam, Adam Hamilton says. Because that's not my role. You do not Call me, and I pray that you continue to do that, to tell you about what Almond on Hamilton says in his research. I want you to pay attention to what the good book says. If you pay attention, and it's on your bulletin, chapter 1, chapter 2, Timothy 1, beginning of verse 1, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. I urge you, and Paul is talking to Timothy here, but Paul is also talking to you. I urge you to pray to all people. 
ask God to help them. That means that you have to pray for Trevor, but also for the Hindu and those who don't profess Jesus as Lord. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. This is not me saying that this is a scripture for those that like biblical-based sermons. What are you doing with this verse right here that tells you that you have to pray for all people, ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them? Pray this way for kings and all of who are in authority so that we can live peacefully and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity, especially this year. For those who are in the office of presidency and government officials. What is your role? What is my role in this? This is good and pleases God our Savior. As Christians, you must consider verse 4. Who wants everyone to be safe. And to understand the truth. For there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. The man Christ Jesus, he gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. My friends, what is your role? What questions do you have and how you begin to answer these questions about where are they going? That 68% of people in the world. What are we to do as a church here in Lake County? You're part of it. If anything, as a leader this year, I would like to create and lead new ways for you to share the gospel. That is my overall goal for this year, for this congregation, which I will begin to share with the session tomorrow. How can we begin to help our congregation reach out to the 68% of the population. Not with the goal of raising more people in the pews because you already know it has changed and it will never go back. But how can we cast that love and reflect and reveal that unselfish presence of Jesus everywhere where we go? How can we help you engage with difficult conversation with peace and dignity, holding true to the gospel that you observe, but also faithful to the loving person who is rejecting Christ because of the abuse of the church? Because ultimately, and this is where I would like to guide you to Matthew 21, Matthew 25, which is the second scripture for today, because there is a point... Verse 31 tells you, but there is a point where the Son of Man will come in his glory. And all the angels with him. Then he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations. Isn't it funny? That doesn't say anything about one particular nation or another. But it says all the nations will be gathered in the presence of Jesus. And he will separate the people as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Have you ever considered how he will separate? It's not about professing simply Christ as Lord and Savior. It's not about following Romans if you declare with your mouth. But pay attention to what begins on verse 41. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, cursed ones, in the eternal fire, prepare for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. So who are they and how are they going to hell? Is it simply about loving Jesus? Is it simply about showing up to church? No, my friends, it requires your work to care for one another. For you to consider who is selected 
to go to hell according to Matthew 21, beginning of verse 41. Those who fail to love their neighbor, those who fail to reflect and reveal the unselfish love of Christ in all that we do. Now, if you are coming to our church, you will see me saying those words often enough to reflect and reveal the unselfish love of Christ in all that we do. Do you know why I say that? Do you know that's the vision of this church that was cast way before I even arrived to this church? To reflect and reveal the unselfish love of Christ in all that we do. So pay attention to the front of the bulletin. All of these things that you see reflected on the front are moments that I found where I could tell you with vivid memory how they reflected and revealed the unselfish love of Christ in all that they were doing at that moment. Same thing goes with the front and the back of the document for the congregational meeting. I can show you how each of those moments were moments of reflection when we were showing the unselfish love of Christ in all that we do. So that's what we are inviting you to participate in this congregation. Not that because we have it all figured out, but because we are putting our eyes not on the law, but on the gospel that wish to care for a brother and sister. Whether they accept Christ or not, we are supposed to care for those around us in a significant way. That's the invitation. That's what I feel the gospel is telling us today. That you choose to see that Christianity is more than paraphrasing the Bible or just going with the cliche of the words that we memorize. But for you to take a chance to reflect and reveal the love of Christ. Because you love Christ and you wish to follow Christ, not simply because you want to avoid hell. My friends, where are they going? The hope is that you show them love while you are engaging with them and that you let God care for them, for his people. We have plenty of work to do, my friends. We are not done. Everything is shifting. But today, we have to reflect and reveal that unselfish love. Let me finish with this. Caroline, Caroline, will you wait? Caroline created this. It looks like a tomato, supposed to be a strawberry. She knitted. And nobody asked her to do this. But she knit this thing with her hands. She put... Uh, very bright smile on yellow in front of the tomato or strawberry. And she gave it to different people who are in the choir. And she asked them to hug it. You know what, what hope she wanted to do this? So that I would take it to Doris. And she will actually receive all the hugs that were there. Obviously, that's a tearjerker, and yes. But you see how insightful and touching is to reflect and reveal the love of Christ in all that you do. That's where I want to serve more. That's what I want you to do more. I want you to take the initiative. I don't want you to wait for me or someone else, but I want you to lead that reflecting, and that revealing of God. We don't want you to sit and be entertained. We want you to come up with your own ideas about how, and the church will come and support you. That's the goal, my friends. To God be the glory. Amen.